Welcome. This is uh, Faith at Home with Pastor. Uh, we have our uh, Don't Sing Songs to a Heavy Heart. Uh, we have about, uh, oh, I have about 25, 30 people uh, in our room today. And of course, we're taping this uh, for Faith at Home with Pastor so that uh, if someone would, were to miss, that they can pull this up uh, from offline. So uh, let me go ahead and uh, uh, we, um, we got a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to go ahead and start that. slideshow from the beginning. This was um, our uh, first uh, lesson was a call to care is the first chapter. Uh, and so moving through call to care, we're going to begin with the biblical understanding of, of suffering is where we are right now. So if you have your book, there's more books up here. Like I said, if you want to grab a book, go ahead. Uh, but there's an opening prayer uh, in this section, biblical understanding of suffering. So let's pray. Open my mind, O Lord, to the influence of your blessed word. Teach me what you would have me know about suffering. Let knowledge chase away my preconceptions and misconceptions. And let love animate the understanding I gain. This I ask in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, with the snowstorm we didn't meet last week. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so we're, we're uh, so it's been two weeks since we've met. I don't know. Over the last couple of weeks, based on what we uh, discussed uh, last time, a call to care. Any any thoughts? You know, we went through these nineteen things, which is kind of nice, challenging challenges in relating to people, uh, afraid of, of not knowing what to say, and and different issues like that. So, so once again, uh, any any initial questions or thoughts that you may have. One of the things I also want to ask uh, as we begin each chapter, uh, Laura actually came up with these two questions, which I think is great at, to begin every time we get together, uh, to have two standard questions, especially those who have prepared and, and read the chapter beforehand. What stuck out to you about the chapter, and when have you been in this situation and it went badly or it went well? So uh, anything as we move into this chapter two, anything stuck out? Or the second question, uh, have you been in, in a situation? I know last last time we got together, we, we all talked a lot about... Um, uh, being in awkward situations of, uh, of not knowing what to say. Or maybe we've been on the other end, on the caring, receiving end, and, uh, and whatever was sh said, you know, it just didn't, didn't make sense. Um, but anyway, think about that. Uh, Lynn? Pastor, um, this week my daughter called me and she said that a friend, one of the friends at work, one of the nurses at work, actually... Um, technicians at work said that her son had committed suicide mm -hmm. and she asked me to talk to her she said can she call you and I said yes so she called me and I just talked to her and listened to what she had to say and we just talked you know gently mm -hmm. um, she's called me every day and we've talked and she told me that I'm a blessing to her for being able to talk to her and listen because most people are not listening to her. They are condemning her for maybe something they thought she did. Um, and I just thought it was really nice that, I mean, every day I've talked to her and she is uplifted rather than being what she was when she first called me. Yeah. So um, I wanted to share that because I thought that was really, really a beautiful thing. I know sometimes we get this idea that people don't want to talk. You know, the, the first care receiver that we uh, heard a couple weeks ago, uh, you know, the conversation started off, how are you doing? And the care receiver, I'm doing fine. You know, and then, uh, then he asked the question once again, well, how are you really doing? And that's when he said everything just came out, you know. So, you know, we, we instantly want to say it's okay or don't want to share. And, and there's times maybe a person's not ready to share. And so, you know, one of the things we'll pick up is just being able to, to pick up on those cues. 
but oftentimes people do want to talk about what they're going through, especially if they know that they're in, they're in a situation where they're being heard uh, and, and truly cared for. Uh, so, so don't assume that they don't want to share. Laura? Um, first of all, I give credit to the Stevens Ministries. They, they, gave, they gave you those two questions. Okay, not, okay. Not that I came up with all <laughs> But, um, you know, kind of piggybacking on what Lynn said, and you said, I, I want to be the kind of person that people will call when they need to talk. But sometimes if you say, how are you really doing? They're like... You know, I still have to hold it together. I'm fine. I'm fine. Don't cry. Yeah. They're, they're not ready to talk. I've had that on more than one occasion where, you know, I kind of feel like if they would just open up, it would be okay. But for whatever reason, they're not. They don't feel safe enough, or they're they're afraid that if they start talking, they they won't be able to stop crying, or you know. I, I think, I mean, every, every time we get together, I, hopefully there's, there's several takeaways that we have when we leave here. And uh, let me just add one takeaway that I really think is very important, is that, that sometimes we come up with an agenda. We come up with what we think they should do, or they should feel, or they should say. And, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 I forget what show it was. There was, was a TV show where this girl was upset with her dad because he he'd always do that well how are you really doing you know it's like you know it's like dad i'm fine <laughs> you know but uh but sometimes you know especially if somebody's gone through something we in our own head saying saying that and, and we could probably tell that they're hurting that they need to let it out but you can't force them to let it out you know because because if you say no no really tell me what what is going on it's like you're, you're, going to, you're going to turn them off more than anything else. You're going to irritate them more than anything else. Because I'm sure we've been in that situation where sometimes we just want some quiet time and we'll share when we're ready to share. You know, but I think, okay, then how can we give someone, and I think Laura Boyd brought it up, you know, give them, at least let them know that whenever you want to talk, I'm here for you. You know, and, and, and maybe uh, you're, you've created uh, a situation where they do feel comfortable coming to you. Uh, but but don't force them to share because we think they should share because they'll feel better if they do share. Uh, you know, like I say you can't can't force the issue. That's not a way to approach it. But um, um, and like I said, I kind of uh, and this is on page twenty of uh, the second chapter. Most people think of Job because uh, like I said, biblical understanding of suffering. Most people think of Job then as the epitome of misery in the Bible. He lost his children, his wealth, his health. Job's story is powerful, but he is not alone. In fact, significant suffering touched most of the men and women who God, whom God called, singled out by a special call. How does it make you feel that God allows his children to suffer? And that, that kind of brings up a bigger question. I mean, people who are anti-Christian uh, will oftentimes say, you know, how can there be a God when there's babies who die, children who die, people, you know, murder other people. Uh, horrible stuff happens in our world. You know, and so, so how could a God let this happen? And so for them, that, that is proof then that there is no God. Uh, but if you really understand scripture, uh, God's people suffer, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, get into Lutheran theology a little bit now, but uh, but you know there are there are some churches that believe in the rapture, uh, and the idea of the rapture for many is that uh, when the tribulation comes, God's going to rapture His people out, uh, so that they will not have to suffer the tribulation. And really, in my opinion, this kind of goes against Scripture. Uh, you know, because because where in Scripture does it ever say that God's going to keep us from suffering? But God is with us. In that suffering. suffering, if we're faithful to him, he is with us. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it's a if. I think he is. <laughs> I think he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we are not, we are not alone. Um, and, um, 
and we're going to get into it a little later, maybe not this time, but because uh, I, I prepared five weeks in advance, I'm trying, trying, you know, don't want to jump ahead, but uh, but some of the the verses, um, you know, that uh, you know, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. I mean, see, certainly these are verses that we cling to. Uh, God will give you nothing more than you can handle. So, I, well, that's kind of really a misquoting of scripture, actually. Um, you know, because oftentimes, you know, we, we get this idea that, you know, God will never give me more uh, than I can handle. It's like, well, that's not really true. Uh, there are people who are dealing with things that they cannot handle. But the thing is, that's the, that's, that's the idea. You give that up to God. You know, let him take it. Um, so anyway, like I said, kind of cover some of that. But, um, uh, but the idea of suffering, and, uh, and like I said, Job's not alone. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of, uh, of people. Paul is going to be referred to a little later in the lesson uh, about that thorn in the flesh that, that Paul dealt with. And he prayed that it be taken away, and it wasn't. You know, and, and, and why? And, and sometimes we have those questions. The prophets had those questions. Why, O oh Lord? You know, uh, Habakkuk, how, old, how long, O oh Lord, <laughs> are you going to let all this stuff happen? Uh, and, and, and yeah, there, there's a lot of head scratching going on with the prophets. And, and it's like, and even today, not really understanding why things happen. But things happen. Um, the biblical understanding of suffering now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Kind of uh, jumped around a little bit in Romans chapter 8. And whatever you see it, dot, 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 there's verses in between there. But I kind of wanted to bring out uh, those key uh, verses. And I've mentioned before, I've, I've used that uh, verse, I consider our present sufferings. Personally, that is always a tremendous comfort for me, whatever I may be going through, to constantly try to focus on eternity and, and, and the big picture. Um, it, it was kind of a, a revelation. Um, D and I, we met, I got referred to D at least once, uh, every time we get together. But anyway, uh, D and I, we met in New Orleans, uh, uh, and, and so we like to go back to New Orleans. And we got a couple of nieces that live in New Orleans. And so we get back to New Orleans once every couple of years or so. But I remember there was one time we were in New Orleans, we were in, in Jackson Square, uh, in the French Quarter, Jackson Square. And, um, and, and there's a Jack's Brewery. It's actually the actually top of a big shopping area. But I remember uh, we went up there uh, because you have a good, we didn't go there to drink. I don't think we even had a drink. But we went up there because you had a great view of the French Quarter. And so we were up there and you, and you see the, the, the entire Jackson Square and the French Quarter. It's really kind of cool. Uh, but, but sure enough, and I think it was St. Patty's Day weekend. I don't know what it was, but, but a parade went, started. <laughs> And it's like, okay, you're in New Orleans, so obviously you're going to have a parade at some point in time. So, so yeah, down Decatur Avenue, uh, there, there was a parade. And so we were up on top. We were about 10 stories up and, uh, and, and looking. And it was really kind of cool seeing this parade. Uh, they're throwing things out like they normally do in, in, a, in a New Orleans parade. Uh, but what was interesting is that you saw the, the front of the parade, and then you can see the back of the parade because of our, of our perspective. You know, it, it wasn't all that long, but still, you could, you know, there's about a dozen or so things that were going by, but we can see the front and we can see the beginning, the beginning and the end. And, uh, and of course, I had a revelation at that point, thinking God's perspective in our lives. You know, it's like we see one thing go by at a time and, and we, don't, we don't always see the end game, you know, uh, but, but God does, you know, God has a perspective of, uh, he knows how it's going to turn out, uh, and and um, and we we need to trust that that whatever we may, we, we may be going through, you know, God has a big picture in mind. So yeah, this chapter, uh, page twenty twenty one, uh, talks about uh, God's eye view of life. We may not understand why things happen. We simply trust that God is in control. Um, 
Now we don't want to go, because I've referred to this also, um, the deist understanding of God. Uh, deism, if you ever heard that phrase deism, it's, 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 it's a belief that God sees everything, but he keeps his distance. Uh, he just kind of watches what goes on, but he doesn't necessarily involve himself in day-to-day -day activities. And so you get that from the Bette Midler song, God is watching us from a distance. You know, you hear that phrase, God is watching us from a distance. That's, that's a deism, deist understanding of God, uh, which is not a Christian understanding of God. You know, because our understanding of God, the Emmanuel, God with us, that God does involve himself in our lives. That God doesn't simply watch us from a distance and just let things go on uh, willy-nilly and uh, you can do what you want and God's going to love you regardless of what you do. And it's like, no, that's, that's not a biblical understanding of, of Scripture. God involves himself. Romans 8 28 I, I did reference this a couple of weeks ago uh, can be a problem when shared with hurting people apart from the context of suffering with Jesus creation groaning and waiting in expectation for a better time this verse offers hope but not immediate relief there is hope in knowing that your present sufferings are temporary and that they are not without meaning but this hope doesn't make present hurts go away That's on page 21, 22. What is meant when the author says hope does not negate pain? Think about that. What does that mean for you? Hope does not negate pain. Well, when you're going through a loss, that loss hurts. And no matter how much hope you have, it's not going to help that hurt. It, it, it still hurts. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Dick? When I gave the example of a woman in labor and talking about the whole earth that Rami has in the of labor, you know eventually it will come to an end and it will be. <laughs> it's still hurts. Yeah. Yeah. But there's that. There's, there's something better. Blame Adam and Eve for that. <laughs> Pain and childbirth, you know, but it's all of us, of course. Um, One of the things that I, I couldn't find in the book, so I wrote it up in the book, uh, was uh, with Job. And uh, of course, when you normally think of Job, you think about all the, the suffering and, the, and the, his friends talking to him and then talking to God and all that. But early on in the book, in the book of Job, it says his friends didn't recognize him, and they came there and they sat, couldn't say anything for seven, for seven days. days. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Sitting there for seven days. You may not have that kind of attention span. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these friends, you know, we might pick on what they, they said later, but they were willing to sit with him just to be yeah. there for seven days. You know, I think uh, some of the takeaways, some of the things we learned from Job, and, you know, certainly a lot, but uh, but I don't think, uh, you know, maybe I should preach a sermon sometimes this, uh, on Job, Job's friends. <laughs> There's a sermon that can be preached on Job's friends, uh, good and bad. You know, it, they certainly was there for him, but, um, but there was some idiotic stuff that came out of their mouths as well. You know, and, and I think... Um, I think that's important because, uh, you know, we all have friends in our lives that some are well-meaning, some words that they share are helpful, some not so much. You know, one, one of the problems I find sometimes with friends, um, especially if, if there's conflict, such as divorce or relationship or whatever, that there are times where friends will just say whatever they think you want to hear. Uh, and think about that. A true friend will say stuff to us that might make us uncomfortable. In fact, it definitely does make us uncomfortable. But that's, 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 that's good. That, that's a good friend. <laughs> you know, if a friend is willing to say something that, that we probably need to hear, um, you know, because I, I see this in relationships, you know, divorce or whatever, 
that uh, that a, a person surrounds himself with people that agree with their side of the issue. Yeah, this little no good husband of mine, and these friends like, oh yeah, yeah, you need to get you, you need to get rid of that bum. <laughs> you know, they 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 tell you what they think you want to hear, uh, and that's not always a good thing. You know, so. Um, Hope does not negate pain. You know, and that's certainly a Christian word, hope. You know, but yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're not going to have struggles. Second Corinthians 12, to keep me from becoming conceited, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness, weaknesses, and insults, and hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It's probably good that we don't really know what that thorn was. Uh, it does no good to compare ourselves to Paul or to others. Everyone's suffering is, is unique. Uh, but whatever it was, some thought it was a physical ailment that he had to deal with. There was, there was a couple of theologians that really was convinced it was, I don't know, it was rheumatoid arthritis or something that... Um, because he got in an argument with John Mark uh, about uh, Paul, you know, they were in a, in, a, in, a, in a coastal town and Paul wanted to go further in. And, and some thought that he wanted to go to higher elevations because he felt better <laughs> in higher elevations than he did in lower elevations because of, I don't know, if arthritis or something, something that, that really gets uh, irritated when, when you're, so, so the higher up you are, uh, the better you are. So you so, so like wanted to leave, when, and, and John and it's like, no, we need to stay here. It's like, I want to go. <laughs> anyway, some were convinced it was that. Some thought it was is a, a temptation, and maybe maybe it was. Maybe it was something that that uh, Satan continued to tempt him, knowing that that he was susceptible <coughs> to that temptation, to that sin, to it, whatever. Uh, some thought it was that. I mean, I, I, we don't we don't know. We don't really need to know. But but what what is helpful for us is we all probably have our own thorns, <laughs> you know, that we struggle with. Um, Lori, you've often said that there's very few sins, if any, that don't stem from pride, and I think this verse kind of encapsulizes this because when we get to thinking that we're, we're strong on our own, that's when we are in trouble. Yeah. Because there's no room for God's grace in those situations. <coughs> when um, I teach this in various classes, adult instruction is one of them, but um, the the benefits of suffering, I'm trying to remember there's there is you know, the textbook answers to the suffering. Uh, it prunes pride. Uh, it uh, chastens us. It purifies us. Uh, but then the fourth is that it, which I think is one of the most important, suffering. It aids our dependence upon God. It aids our dependence upon God. Which, which, which think about that. Uh, think about, given our sinfulness, if we never had suffering... If we never had had struggles in our lives, what would happen to us? And really, it's just because it's just not you, you know, it's all of us. Our sinfulness would lead us to say, you know, I got this handled. I got this under control. Uh, to the point where I don't really need God. There was, there was uh, every once in a while, I know these all algorithms with regards to Instagram or Facebook or whatever, but you know when you view something, you'll have forty other things that'll come up with the same topic. But but anyway, I, I was looking at uh, 
uh, God is not dead. I remember watching it. And so I, I saw various video clips from that movie, God is not dead. But there was a video clip uh, where, where uh, the, the brother of the girl that was converting to Christianity, uh, but anyway, her brother was wealthy and rich. And, and so he was in a nursing home visiting with his mother uh, who had dementia and wasn't really always uh, in, in the here and now. Uh, but he was just kind of um, uh, analyzing his life. It's like, like you're a believer, and look what you're going through. I, I am wealthy. I am successful. I, uh, you know, and he talked about all of these things. It's like, and I, I, I've done all of this without God. It's, it's like, uh, how unfair is, and you know, you know, how unfair for you. Uh, and, and, and of course, then she had a moment of clarity. She said something, I forget exactly the quote was, but uh, pretty much the gist of it is that, uh, you know, God has you in his, you know, Satan has you in his, in the palm of his hand and you don't know it. You know, and I'm kind of reminded of the illustration where, uh, uh, you know, you throw, this is kind of disgusting thinking about this, but you throw a frog into a, a boiling hot water, it will jump out. But if you put a, a, a frog in cold water and then, then turn, turn the heat up and it slowly gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it doesn't realize that it's getting bad to the point where it's too late and, and the frog's cooked to death. Uh, and, uh, and, and the thing is that, uh, that, that Satan you know, just knows how to do that and just like turns up the heat slowly and sometimes we don't realize that it's not good for us uh, because we're comfortable with whatever. Um, any other thoughts? But yeah, the thorn in the flesh uh, struggles. Um, and I, I've said this before, I, I believe every one of us has something that, um, that we struggle with. And, and God knows it, and unfortunately Satan knows it too. Laura? I'm going to quote another one of your sermons that, that really struck me a couple weeks ago when you said something about how um, Satan knows, you know, if Satan's, if the accuser comes to you in the night and says, you did this and this and this and this, you can say to him, yeah, and you don't, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, that, what that tells me is that Satan knows some things, but he's not um, um, omniscient. Omniscient. Yeah. God knows more, and he's Satan's not the boss of us, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we can say, "Yeah, I've done the half." You know, "Yeah, I agree with you. I've done that." But you're not. You're not. You don't know everything. Yeah. <laughs> Christ forgave all of it. Right. Exactly. And, and 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 there's a quote from from Luther. You know, it talks about when when Satan tempts you, turn right around and laugh in his face. Exactly. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I I laugh because because uh, I've heard two different quotes of Luther. Uh, one is, is cleaner than the other, but uh, well, not clean and dirty, but, but it's like laughing. But the actual, there's another quote, when you turn around around and fart in his face, it's actually another quote of, of, of Luther. It's like, eh, probably the second one is what Luther probably said. <laughs> but uh, by laughing in his face. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, don't let Satan, uh, you know, just don't let him bring you down. You know, because cause what are the, what's the goals of Satan? Satan is, uh, he wants to make us feel guilty, shame. Uh, because then we're here when we're in the here and now or we're looking over our shoulder and we're not looking ahead You know, we're, we're not moving ahead um, And and that's what Satan wants us to keep us where we're at and then that's not where God wants us um, I think Satan really works if, <coughs> if It's something as a result of suffering in this world and we're just a victim of the suffering in this world whether it's the cancer or something then, like, we have empathy for that because, well, they didn't deserve that cancer. And how did you get lung cancer? You didn't even smoke. But if you smoked, or if you, your, the consequence of your sin was a direct result of you doing something that was sinful, we're less empathetic mm -hmm. because 
we somehow feel like we're responsible. And I think Satan uses that, like, oh, you weren't a very good parent because your kid did that. Or you weren't, like, um, you should have listened to his laws and taken care of your body and not been smoking and drinking or whatever. And I think that he uses those to get to us so that we don't realize that sin is sin. Mm -hmm. and, and grace is covered by all of them, whether it's our own doing or just because we're part of this sinful world. Yeah. Pastor, in the pools of prayer in the past four days, it goes right along with everything. Um, the one for today, it says, in times of uncertainty in life, it's hard not to worry about things present and things to come. But no matter what present or future difficulties may arise, one thing is always 100% certain. Nothing can separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ. That means neither cancer nor divorce, neither loneliness nor miscarriage, neither poverty or alcoholism, neither our sins nor our guilt, neither natural disaster or death. Nothing can separate us from God because we are justified in Jesus. We have the ultimate victory in Christ, the one who buried our sins, conquered death, and holds us in the palm of his hand. And this has been going on for four days. Mm -hmm. I said, this is so much into what we are studying um, and going with, you know, in our studies on Sunday, but I wanted to share that. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's so many examples of scripture. I mean, you know, one of the things I like to, you know, you know, the, the, publican and the tax collector mm -hmm. uh, in the temple you know and, and Jesus references uh, you know the publican who's like uh, you know sees the tax collector over there at the back of the church like boy I'm glad I'm not like him you know I give you know tenth of my income to the to the church and I give to the poor and I you know he's talking about all these things that he's done uh, and and then the tax collector all he does is bows his head it's like God be merciful to me a sinner and, and then Jesus says, which one of those two do you think is uh, pleasing to God? Um, you know, there's, there's um, I think, Barb, you and I had the conversation once, but, but there, there was a song at the Contemporary Worship that, uh, you know, and I think you, you and I both admitted it the first time we sang that. It's like, uh, you, know, you know, I forget the, the words, but, but it's like, God loves a drunkard. Or, I mean, it mentions all these, all these people uh, that, that, you know, and it's like that sounded so counterintuitive. What, what do you mean God loves the, the drunkard and God? You know, no, no, he doesn't love the fact that we are sinful, but, but he loves us in that, that, we're, that we're all going through something. Once again, we're all sinful. And, and, uh, and I think too many years, I hopefully I don't see this as much in the church anymore, but, but when I was a kid, you know, you always got the opinion that, that everybody else in church had it all together and I'm the only one who has is all messed up you know and so a lot of people felt uncomfortable in church because they felt that they didn't fit in um, you know because there was an error about you know many people and, and and I think I think once we let those things down and once we once we communicate that we're all in the same boat uh, I think I feel that's a much better congregation you know, because cause we don't have it all together. <laughs> you know, even people who, who look like they have it all together, I can assure you they, you know, none of us do. Um, but anyway, um, that the New Testament never asserts the effect, that faith is an insurance policy against suffering. How does that make you feel? And what should we do then when suffering happens? We support one another. We're there for one another. Yeah. Well, one of the greatest examples I've ever seen in my life, um, Bobby was her name, by the name. She was in charge of the evangelism committee, my last congregation. But uh, that was early, early on, toward the end of her life. Uh, she, she was bedridden for 10 years before she finally passed. And uh, just arthritic. I mean, she was, she was, you know, and, and she just couldn't get out of bed. And, uh, and fortunately, she had tremendous care. I remember the, the home health, they'd come once, once a day. 
and 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 they just was was amazed. It was her daughter, really, was kind of taking care of her, and she had other people helping as well. So in the ten years, there was never one bed sore <laughs> on, on on her. You know, it's like which which they were just so amazed, like how someone can be bedridden and not have bed sores. But uh, that's how well cared for she was. But but that being said, uh, you know, she was able to converse and talk and and uh, and just her spirit. And, uh, and, and her joy, uh, she would just always talk about her faith and joy in the Lord, you know, and, and it's like, you know, here's someone that's, you know, doesn't, yeah, she's cared for and stuff, but still, uh, in pain, you know, arthrit arthritis, you know, and, and, and uncomfortable, but yet, uh, she just continued to have joy in the Lord, <laughs> you know, and it was just, it was just an example. For me, and yeah, you can you can say say you know I think sometimes we don't feel we don't realize it's just not always about the person. I mean, I mean yeah yeah you can say why 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 is God allowing her to continue in this situation? Uh, it's like you know take her home, you know be merciful, you know, but yet God is still using her <laughs> as an example to other people, and and maybe that that is her mission in life. I think maybe she understood that. To be her mission in life, uh, that if my suffering can 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 communicate love and joy to someone else, then so be it. You know, uh, and I think Paul said that. You know, it's like, yeah, I I I I'd like to die now and go to go to heaven. <laughs> I'd love to be able to go to heaven right now. He said, but if I'm still here, then then God has a reason for that. And so uh, so Paul, you know, just knew that uh, use me, Lord. You know, take me home. That'd be nice, but but if not, then then that's use me. Yeah. Uh, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne, said, "I'm making everything new." Rather than fixating on his rapidly deteriorating world, John chose to focus on the hope of Jesus' resurrection new life. That was kind of from the last passage from Revelation. The church's unique mission belongs to the transitional period between the beginning of the new creation at the first Easter and its final completion at the end of time. Um... You know, you talk about, you know, interesting, there's, there's two deaths and there's two resurrections. There's spiritual death and then there's, there's physical death and spiritual death. There's a spiritual resurrection and a physical resurrection. And so we were born dead, spiritually dead. So, so that death kind of began at the beginning of our life. Then when we came to faith, we experienced a spiritual resurrection. Uh, so our spirits were dead and now they're alive. And so, so we've already gone through one resurrection, spiritual resurrection. Now, a physical death is going, going to happen at some point in time, and a, a physical resurrection is going to happen. And so, so we've already, already been through one death and resurrection, and we're going to have a, a second. And so with that spiritual resurrection, then our spirits are already living its eternity. We're here in this world. But that's when we die, our spirits will not die because they've, they've, it's been raised. And, and so that, that, that first Easter, but then we're looking at the final completion, uh, when it will eventually come. You see, perhaps no passive scripture has been used more often of, to comfort hurting people than Psalm 23. What comfort do the suffering find here? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. As the shepherd is with his sheep, God is with his people. His presence comforts. It means that when, where, wherever we are, in whatever situation, we are not a, a, alone. I got to change that spelling. Not alone. What is more discouraging and disoriented than feeling utterly alone? The big step in helping others is to help them feel that they are not alone. Um, I mean, you've, you've heard this said that, that you can be in a crowd and feel alone. Or you can be all by yourself and, and, and not feel alone. Well, what, what's the difference? I think the difference is 
one, whether you have faith or not, and how strong is your faith. Mm -hmm. And if if you're lost and without faith, you're going to feel alone even in a crowd. But if you have faith, and your faith is strong, even when you are alone, you're not going to feel alone, mm -hmm. because you know that God is with you. I think about I don't know you know, I wonder what people you know suicide just just you know you know sometimes it catches people off guard it's like I didn't realize that they were in pain you know and I, and I think uh, I sense that it's a feeling of loneliness uh, that they're all alone and uh, and people around them don't realize that they're feeling that you know when when a believer decides to end their life I think part of the lie that they're believing is that they can't handle life the way it is and they just want to go home they just want to go to heaven Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to be able to talk about that and to not, like you said, to be authentic, to, to not assume that everybody at church has it all together. To, to have a community where you can be authentic and say, man, I just feel really lonely. Mm -hmm. And you can feel lonely in a marriage, you can feel lonely in a good marriage, you can feel lonely in a, in a, when all your relationships are good, you can still feel lonely. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean your faith is weak. Yeah. It just means you need other people. Let's see, we got a couple more slides. Christians, by definition, are people who receive the comfort of God and are empowered to embody God's comfort in their relationships with others. We are called into a community of comforters to church, at the head of which stands the suffering God, a source of all comfort. How does the suffering of Christ help us? You know, and in the book of Hebrews kind of talks about Christ understands what we've gone through because he's gone through it himself. And uh, let's see, how many slides? Got uh, three more. But, um, um, but uh, you share in community when you participate in the sufferings of a brother and sister. But you are also called to participate or share in the suffering of Christ. How can this happen? Does Jesus already experience his pain and suffering? And how can you participate in it now? As long as sickness and sadness remain, Jesus still suffers along with those he loves. You may never be more Christ-like than when you participate in the suffering and sorrows of a hurting world. I like, I love that quote at the very end. You, you, you are never more Christ-like than when you participate in the sufferings and sorrows of a hurting world. I know when I talk to people that are hurting, that, that need some support, I always tell them that I'm going to lift you up in prayer. Yeah. Those words are key. Lift you up. Yeah. This is the last slide. Christ, Christians are most like Christ when they enter into the pain of those who are suffering. Not to be weighed down or consumed by it, but to help bear the burden. So when you care for those in need, you are offering a doubly powerful witness to the presence of Christ in the world. Christ alive in you and in the one to whom you are offering care. Being Christ. I mean, I think Christian, the word Christian is, is being Christ in the world. Um, and I think that's all part of the Great Commission. You know, lo, I make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. You know, Jesus is about to leave, but he's sending his disciples out. Uh, he's sending us out uh, to be his hands and feet, and to be Christ-like. Um, so it's good that chapter 2 kind of sets the, the biblical understanding of being Christ-like 
and then uh, then we're going to kind of get into more. The next session is uh, a guest in a holy place. Um, so we're going to talk about that next next time. Um, you know, I, I know originally we and just just kind of give you a heads up. I know we talked about six weeks. Uh, originally, the thought was maybe to go through two chapters each week, uh, but you know, I don't, I don't think there's there's a need to rush through it. Just to rush through it. There's 12 chapters, so this will actually take us to Easter, uh, which is 11 weeks as opposed to, to six weeks. And so, uh, so I, I made a commit. I told you six, and now it's 11. So I, you know, I, I you know, I, I just want to be upfront that if, if somehow you can not able to make the 11 weeks, it's still going to be online, so you can access it through Faith and Homeless Pastor. But I hope to, to have you guys here for the next 11 weeks, uh, or next nine weeks now. But uh, uh, but I just kind of want to give you a heads up that we're taking this all the way through Easter. So if that fits, works for you, that's great. If not, I understand. <laughs> so, so I just want to want to give you a heads up, and the, the pace that we're going is kind of what how it's going to turn out. So, so I think that'll work out. Palm Sunday will be the very last week, uh, then the Easter breakfast, and then uh, we'll do something different after Easter. So anyway, that's what lays ahead. Uh, contemporary worship starts in six minutes. Uh, so uh, anyway, let's, uh, uh, and, and like I said, we're doing this online, so appreciate people who are joining with us. Uh, let's uh, close uh, with a prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity for us to gather together. And once again, we're talking about uh, helping others while at the same time, there's times when we are hurting. Dear Lord, we thank you that we are part of the body of Christ, that we can bear one another's burdens, that we can certainly be there for one another. Help us uh, care for each other and help us to, to look for people that we can be Christ-like to, to uh, in, in, in our help and love for them. Uh, all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.